for what? Issues with the streaming, I presume. Yep. Time, get it. We'll, we'll okay, wait. we're we're up and running. Oh, good. Okay. So let's get back to the get back to the news. Okay, so Hubble's in trouble. The uh, main tel main computer went into safe mode two weeks ago. While the telescope itself is in working order, the science operations have been suspended until the operations team can figure out how to get the payload computer back online. And they're also trying to trace the issue to specific components in the payload computer and then switch those components to their backup module. So they're doing things like looking at the science data formatter and the power control unit um, and testing procedures to switch things over permanently if either of those components turn out to be the culprit. And of course, the reason that we are doing um, ground-based repairs is that we can no longer send up astronauts into orbit to go hang out on the Canada arm and fix things personally. So the uh, given the complexity of these backup systems, the ops team is currently reviewing and updating all the Hubble's operations, procedures, and commands, and all of their items related to backup hardware. They're going to run a high fidelity simulator, uh, hopefully next week, to test their plan of execution and see if they can pull it off. In the meantime, Hubble has, you know, it was launched in 1990. It's taken over 1.5 million images, more than 600,000 of those since its last servicing mission all the way back in 2009. So everybody's fingers are crossed that Hubble will be back in business soon. So, M1, the famous Crab Nebula. Back in the 1980s, uh, researchers at University of Tokyo theorized that the blast that formed the nebula in 1054 was caused not by a type 1 supernova, which is a white dwarf going off like a thermonuclear bomb, or a type 2 super supernova, which is a massive star collapsing on itself after nuclear fusion ends. They theorized it was caused by something called an electron capture supernova. But that was back in 1980. There's not been any evidence necessarily. It was hypothetical. But now a supernova event observed in 2018 may confirm the existence of electron capture supernovae. Study published this month in Nature Astronomy may provide new insights into how the Crab Nebula and neutron stars are formed and how elements are created and scattered through the universe. So in an electron capture supernova, stars within a very narrow size range, eight to 10 solar masses, explode. The enormous internal pressure forces the electrons to fuse with atomic nuclei as the star's core loses fuel. Normally, electrons, which all have a negative charge, repel each other. But when they combine, pressure inside the star drops, provoking a core collapse. This collapsed core sets off an explosion, leaving behind a neutron star somewhat more massive than our sun. Like an iron core collapsed supernova, your classic type two, these electron capture supernovae produce neutron stars, which, you know, there's a pulsar in the heart of the Crab Nebula. So, Records are kept from SN1054, from all the intense study that have been done on it over the years. And astronomers develop predictions about what to look for in an electron capture supernova and its progenitor star. But then in 2018, amateur astronomer, yay, Ko Koichi Itagaki detected an exploding star in this starburst galaxy here, NGC 12 2146. It's about 30 million light years away. Two years after that supernova, which is that big thing on the right that was first seen, researchers at Las Cumbres Observatory and UC Santa Barbara gathered data on this supernova event. It's called SN 2018 ZD. And they realized that it fit the criteria for a potential 
electron capture supernova star, which has six features as defined in the hypothesis. An enormous mass, so say a red giant, it needs to shed most of that mass before exploding. The shed mass needs to be helium, carbon, and hydrogen with little to no oxygen. The explosion itself needs to be relatively weak with no radioactive fallout, and the core remaining should have neutron-rich elements. And it fit. Bingo. They got one. Now that one has been identified and the Crab Nebula has been tentatively identified as resulting from the same process, researchers hope to find more examples of these type 3 supernovae. Okay, so bad news for those of us who are excited about the prospect of life in the cloud tops of Venus. Um, Venus enthusiasts have been hoping for the potential for life in a band of fairly temperate clouds embedded in the all enveloping cloud bank. However, a new study led by a research team from a, a UK German with some support from NASA, they've thrown water on the whole idea. They've showed that uh, the existence of life may have less to do with the quantity of water and more to do with the presence of atmospheric water molecules. Upshot is there's not enough water activity in the clouds. Venus is too dry and we may have better luck finding life in the cloud tops of Jupiter. More not so cool news about water on other planets. So data from 2004 from the ESA Marsis program indicated the presence of large subsurface regions of water ice on Mars. Um, team from ASU, Arizona State University says, now the radar reflections could be clays, metal bearing minerals, or saline ice, which is not going to necessarily support life. They say it is not needed to invoke liquid water at the base of the polar cap to explain the results of the Marsis observations. So this is a, a rendering of what it might look like based on the ESA data. And imagine instead of that tantalizing chunk of ice embedded in the rock, it's just clay. So um, again, they say alternatives include clays, metallic minerals, and salty ice. Since liquid ice water is so important to sustaining life, um, it's of utmost importance to astrobiological studies, but ensuring that we consider other possibilities for reported detections of liquid water is crucial to the scientific process. So it's a bummer, but that's science. All right. Mark your calendars, the largest comet ever is on, ever recorded is on its way through the solar system. Comet Bernardinelli-Bernstein is estimated to be about 1,000 times more massive than the typical comet, making it perhaps the largest comet discovered in the modern era. It has an extremely elongated orbit from the distant Oort cloud, and this is now the most distant comet to be discovered on its incoming path giving us years to watch it evolve as it approaches the sun, though it is not predicted to be a naked eye spectacle at any point in time. So this comet was discovered by two astronomers, uh, Bernard and Ellie and Bernstein, following a comprehensive search of data from the Dark Energy Survey. They've estimated it based on its current brightness versus its distant position to be about 100 to 200 kilometers across or 10 times the diameter of most comets. So here's an image of it from the Dark Energy Survey, twinkling in dead center in that image. The orbit is perpendicular to the plane of the solar system. It will reach perihelion, or the closest point of the sun, in 2031. It will still be around 11 astronomical units away, so we're talking out just beyond the orbit of Saturn. Therefore, A, it poses no threat to Earth, B, it will require a large amateur telescope even at its brightest. So let's not hype this puppy to the public because they won't be able to see it without our help. 
Okay. Over the east northeastern horizon uh, from about 4.20 your local time until around 5 a.m. Uh, they will be close enough to see them through binoculars together. But, you know, of course, you want to put the uh, put the binoculars away when the sun comes up. And on Monday, July 12th, extremely bright Venus and a much fainter Mars will meet in a very close conjunction low in the west northwestern sky. They've both been traveling eastward, but the faster motion of Venus will cause it to catch up to and pass Mars very soon. So look closely. Venus is dead easy. I saw it last night just hanging out in the driveway in St. Clair Shores looking at um, fireworks. But Mars is only 0.18 magnitude, so 200 times fainter than Venus, which is almost negative four. It'll be 34 arc minutes away, so about a full moon diameter to the left. So start looking, get Grab your unobstructed horizon, start looking about 9 p.m. local time. They will be about a fist diameter above the horizon. And, uh, you know, use your binoculars after the sun goes down. They'll be in view uh, from tonight through the 21st, but they'll only be close enough to fit in a telescope from the 11th to the 14th. All right. So cross your fingers for clear skies. And that is in the news in the sky. All right, 744, a brief rundown of officers reports. So your officers are plowing ahead with plans for a good picnic as our return to in-person events. The fourth Saturday in August, the picnic will begin officially at 4 p.m. Uh, officers will be arriving an hour to two hours beforehand to set things up. If you are interested in volunteering to assist, we recommend you get there no later than three. Um, officers will be providing burgers, dogs, buns to put them in, condiments to put on them, and the vegetarian equivalent thereof. We will also be providing cold pop. We recommend that rather than the customary dish to pass at this time, we simply ask you to bring whatever you want to chow down on. If you want to make a bin of your favorite cookies, set them out on the table um, and share, that's cool. If you want to simply brown bag your absolute favorite thing and eat it privately and at the table, that's cool too. We want everybody to be comfortable. Um, if you do volunteer to assist the board with food prep, we do ask that you wear a mask. That's that's the one rule. You don't have to wear a mask to hang out, chill, unless you want to. But if you are engaged in food prep, we do ask that you, you know, protect everybody from <laughs> breathing hot food. Uh, we also will have a swap meet. Um, Dale Parton is in charge of the swap meet portion. We will, it's um, pretty low key. We expect we're probably gonna be spreading things out in a blanket by the pavilion and letting people browse, uh, swap, and or pay people as they prefer. Um, the club is not making money off of it, so you'll be dealing with whatever individual people are sharing their stuff. For instance, I know um, uh, the sister of our uh, late lamented member, Pat Brown, will probably be bringing some of his collection to dispose of at the event. So if you've been sitting on gear and thinking, man, I wish I had a swap meet to take this stuff to, take it to the picnic and uh, see what happens. Uh, and of course, if the weather is clear, observing will follow that night. So mark your calendar, final, final Saturday in August, all systems remain a go for the picnic. Uh, two other things for the presidential report. One, it is halfway through this year. Um, at least one of our board members is term limited out, that being outreach chair, Bob Trumbly. Um, if you are interested in joining the WAS board, either uh, approach the officer in question that you are uh, in thinking of succeeding or email us collectively, let us know because we want people to be able to feel comfortable transitioning onto a board after this very interesting past two years. And, uh, you know, some things from outreach events may be a little bit different going forward. 
and we'll hear something some from Bob about that. Anyway, um, if you are interested in serving the board, just let us know. We are we are all ears. We are excited. If anybody would be interested in taking over other duties, such as official librarian, astronomical league coordinator, or other positions that are not uh, constitutional board elected positions, let us know because we would also be happy to parcel those out. Okay, and finally, I am pleased to announce that our editor, our publications editor, Dale Teamy, has won the highest honor of an, that the Astronomical League provides to Astronomy Club's newsletter. Dale and the WASP have won the top prize, the Mabel Stearns Award for this year. So, um, the full encomium to the grandeur and depth of the WASP and all its fabulous contributors can be seen in this month's issue of the WASP. Um, we have been uh, trying for years to get this level of recognition for what we have thought and previous presidents have thought is one heck of a newsletter that absolutely deserved it. We are incredibly pleased on Dale's behalf that the club has achieved this honor. And we'd also like to thank the person who helped spearhead the submission, Gary M. Ross. So thank you, Gary, for kicking that off. Thank you, Dale, for an incredible newsletter. Thank you, previous newsletter yes. editors, for building the edifice on which the current quality of the WASP stands. And we look forward to uh, this grandeur of the WASP being upheld going forward. And on that very happy note, I'd like to pass things to our program chair, Dr. Dale Parton. Okay, thank you, Diane. Uh, just one comment about the swap meet at our picnic. Um, you know, you might, if you want a blanket to put your, your equipment on that you'd like to sell, you might bring it or a card table or anything like that. I don't know. Uh, whether there will be picnic tables available uh, enough of them for people to put their stuff on. Um, okay, at our next meeting on July 15, Brian Odom will be our speaker. His topic will be how to get started in astrophotography, how to maximize joy and minimize cost. Uh, then, a month from now, on August the 2nd, I will give the main presentation. Uh, my topic will be exploring the Galilean moons. Uh, the short presentation will be given by Bob Trumbly. His topic, what makes you say wow when it comes to astronomy? Uh, and beyond that, I would just like to say I'm always looking for new speakers. Uh, please let me know if you have any interest in giving a presentation. Uh, Diane, back to you. Very good. And uh, Dale was uh, pitching to us at the board meeting the idea of having a very cool talk anthology set up for the beginning of next year. So. If you have been thinking of a talk somewhere between 15 and 40 minutes in length, something in the 20 or 30 minute range, maybe about your personal journey into astronomy, something like that, let Dale know. And with that, I'll hand things over to Riyadh, our observatory chair. Thank you, Diane. Hello, everyone. Um, our observatory and uh, the dive shed are both in good uh, shape. I visited them um, on June 19th. Um, did some cleaning too while I was there. Everything is uh, ready for us, hopefully ready for the picnic. And um, as uh, uh, Diane mentioned, uh, on the 28th, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see everybody out there. Um, in the meantime, of course, um, we don't have an, an open house uh, for uh, July. However, we will um, try to have another uh, virtual observing session with uh, Doug Bug if he's uh, available 
Uh, so far, he has been, and those uh, virtual sessions have been extremely important and, and extremely um, uh, entertaining and, and filled with uh, a lot of knowledge as well. So uh, this, is, this has been really uh, uh, a good thing for, for, the, uh, for our observing uh, sessions. Um, and that's, uh, that's all I have at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Riyadh. And uh, Mark Kedzier, Secretary. Thank you, Diane. I just want to say the the minutes of the June meetings are in our award-winning publication, The WASP, and that's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And Adrian, treasurer on the road. Yep, as you heard, I, I am on the road as usual chasing the sunset, but held steady. Um, north of $22,000, north of uh, $3,200 for GLAC. Um, I have processed the Astronomical League dues um, membership renewals for our club. Um, and in covering those, we are at north of $500 now in our PayPal. Please contact me if you have any questions about astronomical league membership. I am currently taking on that job until, or if someone wants to volunteer to be our full-time astronomical league coordinator. So that is it for my report. Thank you, Adrian. And Bob Tremblay at Outreach, complete with the GLAC update. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, yeah, well, the outreach report is in our award-winning newsletter, The Wasp, but uh, I'll cover some things. Adrian Bradley is doing his uh, weekly uh, things with Explore Scientific uh, podcasts or, or a live streaming. Ken Burton is doing his uh, report on objects in space every Wednesday on Facebook. Um, if anybody is doing any outreach, uh, astronomy outreach, please let me know so I can include it in our uh, our newsletter. Um, we uh, Black met, and we're just we're working out what 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 we want to do. Brian Adam uh, sent out a uh, uh, a survey, and we had a whole bunch of members of the public and volunteers, previous volunteers uh, at at the astronomy at the beach event. Uh, give a response. I'll just summarize here. The takeaway is we could get a lot of guests if we held an in-person event and promoted it as usual. We're struggling to get scopes, though. A lot of astronomers are kind of like about bringing scopes. So if you are interested in bringing your scope, uh, let me know so I can <laughs> you know, assuage the fears of the blackboard. Um, a virtual event would get moderate attendance like last year. Uh, a lot of people would like to see some virtual component, so we're we're doing this as to whether we're going to do it all in person, all <clears throat> uh, well, we're not we're not doing it all online. Um, but uh, most of this depends on what the park requirements are going to be, so we're we're going to have to follow those. So still in the air. Uh, look, we're going to have an event, whether it's in person. I, it's probably going to be in person, but again, there, there, you know, mask mandates and all this stuff. So um, keep an eye out. We'll, we'll keep be posted in the WASP and in other future out feature outreach uh, reports. Um, let's see, do I have anything else here? Uh, yeah, well, that's pretty much it for outreach. All right, thank you, Bob, and finally. Dale TV of the award-winning Warren Astronomical Society paper. Well, I guess the only thing left for me to say is our award-winning newsletter is online for the month of July. And I just want to thank everybody for um, their well wishes that they've emailed me and for all the contributors that actually make the WASP what it is. So I applaud you all. Thank you. That's my report. Indeed. And if you would like to contribute to the award winning WASP, Dale is always grateful to accept new columns and new column ideas. All right. I don't see Solar Marty, but I was talking to him just the other day. So I've got the uh, sun right here. Unless Bob can beat me to it. One moment. Doo -doo -doo. 
There we are. This is the sun. We had a fabulous active region, 2835 that is rotating off. We have a couple of little freckly active regions behind it. But yeah, last week we had a fantastic sunspot. And um, I don't know about you. I was in no mood to take my telescope out. Uh, sorry about that. But uh, solar activity is at least something we can count on on a regular basis now. And double star group, Riyadh. Yes, um, definitely we will have a list uh, for uh, for the 28th when we're out uh, at uh, the observatory and hopefully we'll do some observing. Now, one of the things that uh, maybe I should mention is um, we will be trying to do some observing through a, um, uh, a camera system that we will put on, a, on, on our telescope and then maybe project the image we will try to project the image outside through a projector onto the screen that's mounted on the east side of our dab shed. So if that works, that would be wonderful. We could all then be uh, seeing uh, light images uh, through our telescope. All right, and Astronomical League. So Jonathan, do you want me to give this report or do you I have think, anything extra? I think you can give it, Adrian. Other than, all right, yeah. As I mentioned during the treasurer's report, which I forgot to mention is in our award-winning WASP newsletter. I have to keep that theme going. Um, I did process, um, I don't have the exact number, but I processed, I know north of 50 um, new, Astronomical League memberships and uh, sent them in. I am now familiar with the uh, board members of the Astronomical League because they also come onto the Explorer Scientific uh, Global Star Party, Dave, as well as Dave Levy. So, quick plug to uh, check those out Tuesday nights starting at nine o'clock EST. Um, and so, we will. I will follow up with those board members to make sure our memberships have been properly processed and that we are all good to go. Um, again, like I said in my report, if you have questions, uh, please let me know. Um, if you're not sure if you're an Astronomical League member or you think you sh should be, um, I can verify for you if your name was on the roster. Um, so that's, that's all I've got right now. Um, any other any other questions about the Astronomical League, you can contact me and I will follow up with those. Thank you, Adrian. And uh, finally, discussion group, of course, has been uh, suspended as long as we're doing the uh, virtual events. We will be reevaluating where to go with discussion groups, um, probably towards September when we start having in-person Stargate events again. So stay tuned for that. All right, it is 8.01. Uh, we have time for a few brief observing reports. So raise your hand or throw a stack in the chat. Uh, David Levy, I see your hands up. Let's start with you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I do have today's sun report. Uh, we've been cloudy most of the nights, but the days have been clear enough that I've been able to get some sun. There was um, that great big spot is going off the sun now, but it still showed 11 sunspots today. And there were 15 prominences. That was really pretty special. Anyway, and I'm going to give you my quotation, my poetic quotation now. And it's from Stephen Crane. And it goes like this, a man said to the universe, sir, I exist. However, replied the universe, the fact has not recreated in me a sense of obligation. Stephen Crane only lived from 1871 to 1900. So he died pretty young. He was also wrong, I think, about in his, almost as beautiful as his poetic quotation might be, I think he was wrong when he said the universe really responded that I don't really care, I don't give a darn that you exist or not. Because our universe consists of a multitude of galaxies 
squillions of galaxies, squillions of clusters of galaxies, walls and voids and everything else, each like the other. But only one, only one of each of us, there is only one Adrian in the entire universe of all the galaxies. There is only one Adrian. There is only one of my wife, Wendy. Nowhere else in the universe is there another Wendy. And that means there's no one, no one else of me. But as beautiful as this quotation is, I'd like to end by saying, Stephen Crane, I think you were wrong. And with that, I'm going to give it back to you. And thank you so much. Thank you, David. Well, maybe if uh, poor Stephen Crane had gotten to live a bit longer, he would have changed his mind about things. Yeah, that's what I he was. A, he was a youngster. All right. Yep. Uh, I've got other... my hand raised. Very good. I can't see that, but Adrian, take it away. Yep, I'm still safely driving. Uh, my observation report um, just comes not with pictures this time, since it'd be unsafe to try and fumble through with them. But from visually observing the Milky Way from Lake Hudson State Recreation Park, the um, the day, the night before the smoke arrived from the wildfires from Canada, um, clouds were clearing, and I arrived at the park to test something out. I'm not actually sure what I was testing. I think it was a new new backyard EOS. I was going to test some. Uh, sharpening of stars using backyard EOS. Um, I looked at the Milky Way and I've seen the Milky Way in a Bortle II sky. And uh, so I've seen structure and color in the Milky Way. I've seen it in a Bortle III sky where you can see that same structure, but you cannot see quite the color your brain fills it in. Lake Hudson is a Bortle IV, uh, is within a Bortle IV sky. But looking up at it, I, I saw a Milky Way that I'd seen in a Bortle Three sky, probably the best that Lake Hudson has had to offer in the time that I saw it. And I did not have the camera rolling. And uh, when I took the pictures, clouds came and covered the Milky Way. I waited for them to uncover the Milky Way and uh, finally got a few shots off. When I got done, the clouds cleared. And once again, I had what appeared to be a Bortle Three Milky Way. So apparently I was only allowed to see it, but not capture. It's one of the few times I wish I could have taken everybody to see how dark the sky had actually gotten. It was a brief a brief respite from uh, the noise pollution that normally clouds Lake uh, Lake Hudson out. With the clouds there, I imagine it blocked it and made that sky as dark as it once must have been maybe 10 years ago. So that is my, that is my observation report. Excellent. And I think we have time for one more. Do we have one more intrepid observer to weigh in? I had raised my hand, Dan. Oh, cool. I didn't yeah. see that. Excellent. Yeah, this is sorry. I, I was out. I, I got to see great dark skies too. I was out at the kind of the western Nebraska up in the panhandle. And um it was it was just tremendous skies. It was horizon to horizon um uh stars. There was no clouds and it was just beautiful. Got you could see I'm 31. I had nice binoc just binoculars, nice. but but boy, it was just Tremendous, and you could see all the structure in the Milky Way, and you know where it ends in that. So it was really great. Wonderful. Okay. I well, saw fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Fireworks. I saw Venus. That was the highlight of my weekend. Was seeing Venus naked eye, and reminding myself, oh yeah, there's something beyond those clouds. Oh. Went back to. I went back to Lake Hudson for a another view the next night, and that's when the smoke had arrived. Yeah, disappointment that was doesn't describe it, but we'll wait till the smoke clears.
All right. Well, uh, we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, but that's fine. I would like to hand the baton over to our uh, first vice president, Dr. Yale Parton, to introduce the speaker for the first speaker of the night. Take it away, Dale. Okay. Uh, thank you, Diane. Um, tonight, our short presentation will be given by our very own Gary Ross, well known for his eclectic presentation style. Um, Gary has been a member of the Warren Club since time immemorial. Um, his observing equipment has an ancient pedigree. His presentation style is his own. Uh, the topic tonight is in search of our four NASAs. Gary, it's all yours. Gary, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Please not be second while I switch in. Okay. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Yes. This page. Oh, page. Down right there when you're ready to go next. Oh, page. Down here. This is what? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, there is a phrase that I encountered more than a few times in my checkered and largely unsatisfying academic career. And it was, it, you'd encounter it at uh, with conference papers where the presenter or the presenters would say, well, this is a work in progress. In translation, it meant it's what we could cobble together to come to the academic meeting just to uh, have something to say. And this presentation, I'm sorry to say, skirts with that philosophy. The Ahab, as you know, is the, uh, is the character in Moby Dick who is dragged down by the whale. And my colleagues and I, at least in the year 2020, were dragged down by the whale of the star R in Thornax. If you could lean a little closer to the mic, Gary. Okay. Oh, all right. I will speak louder. Is that sufficient? Okay. All right. Is it good? Is it good enough, right? Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Go yeah, ahead. continue. All right. You can hear me fine. Uh, two gentlemen have made this discussion possible especially given this medium, and without them, we would all be consigned to some Cranbrook meeting and overhead transparencies, which does have its own charm. This is how the star R in Fornax, and the R uh, denotes a variable star, and the fact that it is R means it is the first variable star discovered in a given constellation, in this case, Fornax. Interestingly enough, in the great Bechvar catalog uh, that accompanied the Atlas of the Heavens, the star is not even mentioned. In Burnham's great trilogy or triad or triptych, 
we see it's 387 days and the spectra the spectrum as it existed in the 1970s was n class Gary. Built in the senate in the great catalog essentially the same period also cited as mirror class or a long period variable but with a spectrum of c class c which is the new or was then the new carbon star class and the little e means an emission star emission lines in the spectrum gary are you now, still showing us your title slide me or us started in the great carbon star search are the incomparable of Rowan and Martin or Sinatra and Martin, but let's say they are the team who annually writes the article in the observer's handbook on carbon stars. This has been going on for about 10 years in the RASC handbook and their um, detailed roster of carbon stars throughout the entire sky got me interested in looking at them. We see that by 2019, or approximately two decades into the current century, the, spe the understanding of the spectrum of this carbon star had evolved to a greater level of detail as in C4E still admission. Gary. So we see the range of this carbon star it is visible not quite to the naked eye and has a, a bottom of its amplitude at 13th magnitude. Gary, can you There's hear me? There's a constellation of Fornax. Now, for some greater sense of context, Orion is to our upper left. The, as, as Eridanus winds northward toward uh, Beta Orionis or Rigel. We can't see and Orion. We're still looking at the, the title screen. The constellation is to the upper right. Fornax is not a very exciting constellation, at least to constellation watchers, but it is the home to the Fornax group of galaxies. So little Fornax has its own call to fame. And we see that there is a lone galaxy in the middle of Fornax and uh, not terribly a lot else to the naked eye. Hey, Gary. One more detailed view. Mr. Ross. Now, here. Are you having problems at your end? Yes. Yes, we cannot see anything but your title slide. Oh. Sorry about that. Let me see if we can fix that. How are we now? Good. Now we're good. My apologies. I had the wrong window open somewhere. Yes, he did. Uh, it is a, a, a matter of, of great truth in criminal defense work is that co-defendants will usually sell one another out. A prosecutor can count on it. It was all his fault. Yeah. I, I was across town when it happened. Oh, we're, we're, I'm going to mute you all again so that you're not getting the echo. Go ahead. Do you want the pointer? Yes. Put the Oh, the pen. Yes. The first thing that comes up below it. There. We're, we're all muted are, except for y'all. Our Parnassus. Parnassus being the possessive, the possessive 
of Fornax. It is just below Papa Ceti. That is the star which I use, Papa Ceti, to begin dropping down into Fornax to find R. And in this larger scale, we see a great number of galaxies clustered between Fornax and Eridanus. This is an even closer view. There is R. Now, in my star hopping uh, method, I would drop from kappa down to T, down to TY, variable star in foreign acts, and Clayton went into the Henry Draper catalog trying to find some information on TY for, for NASIS and without much result. But moving right along, this here is our Fornax. Its greatest brightness is approximately 7.5, and it bottoms out more or less at 13.0. The significance of these star R for Nasus in this context is that it was to be the final star in my report to Ostromeki and Husiak about small aperture applications in searching out their carbon stars from a mid northern latitude location to wit southern Michigan. And this project began in the winter of 2020 with various small or moderate size apertures and was to conclude in the first days of September because R was the last one on the list. Here are the dates on which we I'll take a couple of others down with me on this one. We attempted to acquire our Fornassus. As said earlier, the program for the carbon star list generally was to conclude at the beginning of September. We were going to, we or at least I were going to celebrate victory and march out with flags flying. That is not what happened. From the observatory log, our Fornassus observed in five centimeter telescope at 30 magnification, moonlight made a challenge, lusterless or grayish question mark, approximately 7.25 for Atlas of the Heavens field edition, Carbon Star Program, Finney. Well, it's like the light at the end of the tunnel, or shall we say, the final push until victory. That is not, however, as it turned out. Sixteen through seventeen September, R for Nasus. 45 power, 5 centimeter refractor with W. Beers, J. McBride. Gray, orange question mark, slight red. Confusion. The night of Friday the 18th to Saturday the 19th. R for NASA's observations in 10 inch Newtonian by W. Beers and this observer, faint with uncertainty, all previous work in serious doubt, misidentification in first observation bias, need Atlas Eclipticalis, which we did not have. As my dear father would say, 
like the Russian army, showing up late and with the wrong size ammunition. The night of 14 through 15 October, at a location in northern Michigan and Wexford County, which I must not reveal in the interest of hemispheric security, R4 NASA's observed in five centimeter a telescope at 45 power, could not see it. A diagram accompanies this sad entry into the observing log. Sky deteriorated rapidly from the west, preventing use of the 10 inch Newtonian reflector. One to two December. R4 NASA's not visible in 11.5 centimeter Newtonian with a nine millimeter eyepiece at constellation transit. And it goes downhill from there. Nine through 10 December, determination to try final time came apart, sky too turbid. Well, better luck next year, literally. We are going to be laying for it come late summer. No more Mr. Nice Guy with our Pornassus. I will be waiting for it south of 36 at snow over the Great Seal, which stretches uh, maybe a quarter of a mile a kilometer with an excellent horizon. Moreover, I have enlisted those whom I used to consider the finest minds to engage it in northern Michigan. It's a tensor effect. Of course, we've heard that one before. I mean, look at um, how successful the French and the Russians were in the opening days of the First World War. In other words, we'll get them on all sides. I must say, that this was a lesson in humility. Um, I view myself as a fairly humble man. Of course, it depends on the enterprise. But this taught me that one's first observation can bias the rest of the work. It was nowhere near maximum when I observed it at the beginning of September. The star was probably somewhere near it, the, the bottom of its curve, did not have the proper telescopes to go after it. And this is what makes observing interesting. After all, we're in this for the sport because it ain't for the money. These are the sources for this, um, well, somewhat rattle trap presentation, or should I say, Voyage of Self Discovery, and the one that began it all, to repeat, was the article, the annual article by Oscar Mackey and Husiak in the Observer's Handbook of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And I suppose, as Lyndon Johnson said in 1966 about our adventure in Vietnam, we're going to nail the coon skin to the wall. All right. Do we have any questions for Gary and his fellow yes, I have one. mariners? I, I, I have a question. Gary? Yes. So in the fall, what are you going to do differently to complete your quest for R for NASA's? Well, I might use a 10 inch Newtonian at a location I cannot repeat for hemispheric security. I might even try to use the reformed mighty bore 16 inch at the Wien Observatory, or I might get my five centimeter refractor 
it is mounted on a broken camera tripod in the motor mount of a forced air furnace held on with the original coat hanger wire from the 1973 expedition to Africa. Does that answer your question? Yes, I'm sure that last scope will do the job for you. It's part of me. Yes. <laughs> By the way, one final note, especially uh, to you, who is the uh, master of the table at a certain location. Uh, smoke gets in your eyes is the flagship song from Roberta in 1933, which sent Bob Hope on his uh, road to stardom. Perfect. Good job, Gary. All right, excellent. Any more questions? We have time for one more question. Go ahead, put it here. Put it right here. What's the next star then after our Fornassus quest is completed? I intend to enter a monastery and give up the natural sciences. I don't oh. believe you. There's going to be a next one. Oh, look at Bill Beers taking his noble brow. Well, what I may very well do when I took on the, uh, the list in the observer's handbook, I only picked out stars of a certain uh, magnitude range. Then, which was about half of the stars which they enumerated in their uh, annual article, I might very well go after the other half. But I'm going to need a bigger telescope than a five centimeter refractor. Now I'm in possession of a four inch F15 on a bell and hollow mount, and I will not describe how I came by that. There's an ounce of larceny in all of us. <laughs> and a pound in others. <laughs> you stole it? Well, no, wait a minute. No, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, listen to him. All right. William, technically, no. And uh, I'm going to go with that, right? I, that's how, that sounds good to me. Let's put it this way. There's a certain amoeboid let's say encirclement of the, you know, and then it slowly is drawn into the main body. You get it, get it? For the price of a pint, Ken, I'll tell you all about it. Gary Ross, ah. Gary Ross, don't ever change. All right, and on that, that note from our astronomer extraordinaire, it is 8.31, let's take a 20 minute bio break. Throw up your favorite links, songs, pictures, whatever in the chat. Have a good time. Talk amongst yourselves, and we'll see you all at 10 till for the future presentation. Diane, I got a question for you. Yes. Are you re Is this thing recorded? I was on the golf course until the last minute. but Yes, uh, it's recorded. It is good, because I want to see the earlier part. I didn't see oh, it. Oh, very good. Yeah, no, we're streaming on, oh. on YouTube. Yep. Thank, thanks a lot, Val. <laughs> Thank you, dear. I'm surprised you could even find the constellation at this uh, latitude. Which one are you talking about? Pornassus. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, not seen it. not easy. No, agreed. Okay. Yeah. I'm sitting there doing a fireworks thing with my family uh, last night uh, at my son-in-law's house uh actually saturday night and uh i'm pointing out the different stars to my family and they're completely uninterested <laughs> it, was, it was it was traumatic but it was okay
So for those who might care, um, I did make it to my destination and the sun is bright, but there's a shelf of clouds in the distance. So don't know how my sunset pics will come out, but I'm here safely and listening uh, in see. on the background. So Adrian, where are you? I am at St. Joseph. There's a beach in the distance and I'm going to get a couple shots of the uh, lighthouse while I'm here. Hopefully you can get a sunset. Looking very good with the uh, shelf of clouds that the sun is dipping into. St. Joseph, like over at Benton and Harbor area? I hear that if it were clearer, I could go 60 miles south and get a good shot of Chicago across Lake Michigan. I'll have to try that another time. Okay. So I haven't really gotten my telescope out in about a month. I've been on vacation and been busy. And the first night I set it up was when the <laughs> For imaging was when I, uh, you know, we we had all that smoke come in, and you alerted to me that that was the case, and I didn't realize it. Um, and then I saw them, the you know, the smoke cloud cover maps. It's like, oh, great. <laughs> so it's it's directly over Michigan. It's almost yeah. shaped like Michigan. You know, I didn't even think about it. like all oh, the you know the wildfires are done. Is, is it coming mostly from uh, Canadian wildfires? Yeah, it's swirling over, yeah, um, and it's dropping down directly over Michigan, and it's wide enough to cover the entire state. It's starting to drift into Ohio as well. Yeah, I it's really like, enjoy. Yeah, visual observation says it's not as bad where I'm at, 
it's there's still a haze, but I'm seeing a little darker blue than I see when I'm at home. So there's hope. I um I have two nights imaging on the Iris Nebula. I don't know how that will affect it. I have not looked at the data yet. So we will see. I'm I'm yeah. gonna try to get I'm I've trying got to get two hour... more nights, see if I can get 20 hours to go really deep. Maybe yeah. I'll get enough good stuff. There's your smoke I've got, up. I shot at Cygnus, and I've got an hour of data, and I was able to get data. Um, I, I figured shooting at the Zenith, where I could visually see more stuff, I tried that out, and that seemed to, you can get, the light is coming through it, but not as freely as it normally would. So I think you're still getting some light. So I was on vacation recently and we went to Alaska and I was thinking, oh, well, you know, it's summertime in Alaska. You're not going to see the night sky. I really didn't think much about astronomy. And I knew the partial eclipse was coming up, and I just like, oh, well, I'm going to miss that because I'm going to be gone. Here to find out, um, Alaska was one of those states where I could have seen it, um, and I should have brought my solar filter. Now, it would have been at 2 a.m., um, and I would have had to, you know, I was in Fairbanks the night that that happened. Um, and it was pretty overcast, but... I was so dead tired, but if I had my filter, that would have been interesting to see the difference compared to what you guys were seeing at sunrise. You know, it would have been closer towards sunset um, up there. So, I don't know. It, it may Missed have the opportunity. Wind here, but yeah, that, you, <laughs> if you would have tried it, you'd have tried shooting at the narrowest aperture possible. Yeah. And you might have gotten something. Still. Well, I mean, we, we didn't have a telescope or anything, just, you know, whatever. Uh, but it, it's sad because it would have been an interesting perspective from a different location. Um, but, uh, yeah, northern Alaska had some opportunity to see that. So, oh, well. Adrian, where are you um, going to uh, uh, to see the sunset? I am out here in um, where am I at? I'm uh, Saint Joseph. Oh, okay, okay. Thanks. Yeah, I actually let me go to show my camera. Okay, let's see if this works now. Um, Oh, well, nothing because Doug's showing the smoke. Uh, yeah, I, so I would have to flip the camera around and have everybody. Let's see if I can flip this. Uh, let's see if I can flip this camera. There around. you go. I, I, I stopped I stop okay, showing. Yeah. All right. I'm going to start my video. Uh, Adrian, okay, here's your, where your I'm at. app has the background blur on. Like for ah, darn it, uh, <laughs> fix that. So superior, you know, virtual background, <laughs> cluttered basement, None. or whatever. Okay, I, I never turned turn it, it off. off. Yeah, all right. So that's where I, that's my situation right now, and that is what I want to take a shot of right there. That is, could be, the you shot. can get some really warm colors there. Yeah, and that's what I'm With doing. That smoke. I figured there would be some smoke there. And yeah, the shot that I'm showing you right now is a shot I actually want to take. So you'll have to pardon not seeing yeah. anything but my pocket because I'm going to try and take that. Yeah, but uh, that don't is. Slow you, don't let us slow you down. Go ahead. Oh, no, you're, we're fine. I'm going to narrow this up. I'm going to. All I'll right. So I'm going to share. Well, he's, well, he's share. taking. Well, he's taking pictures. I'm going to share a couple things because I got to get ready for the presentation, anyways. Let's see, I need to do something. Hold 
like this, this. Yeah, that's basically the same shot. That's a tall step ladder. <laughs> Uh, yeah, over here on the left. <laughs> that was big Dob. <laughs> that, yeah, there's a 25 inch uh, Dob sitting there in the. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it is a tall ladder. <laughs> I only need a, the 18s right here. I only need a little three stepper for for Zenith there. I don't even need to get up past the first step. Uh, this you need this to get 20, like an F2 Dob. Well, this 25 is Rich Brenz's scope. Actually, this both of these scopes are his. He runs the 25 while I run the 18. And then I get here's my setup for my 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 uh, time lapse stuff sitting there. You can't see it in the dark, but this was called this was a few years ago. This is my Boone property. Nice. Um, what I was going to show was uh, doing some wider field stuff with that 300 millimeter I bought off of Adrian. <clears throat> this is uh. This is with like my new uh, ASI 2600. Um, How do you like that compared to the other one? Do you notice a difference? I mean, it's the same field of view. It's just um, newer, cleaner. I've, I, I've only had it one night. I've only uh, had okay. it out right. one night. So, and that's what I was just going to show that this is NGC 6946. I think this is 6930 or 39, whatever, um, with the 300 millimeter. And that, I, you know, this came out pretty nice. I like the fact that I got this dark lane in here, et cetera. And Is that I, done at F4? Yeah, at F4. All right. Um, and at the same time, the 10 inch was taken. Is it done through smoke or through? Uh, no, the smoke earlier. hadn't quite hit us that yet. This was March, oh, July okay. 1st. July 1st. Yeah. Um, and then while, I, while the wide field was running, I was running the 10 inch with my 071. Oh, I take it back. I'm sorry. This was with the new 2600, this shot right here, through the 10 inch. And this was taken with my 071. So, okay. and it's the first time I actually used a Unity gain on any camera since I've ha owned these cameras for a little bit. Just said it's a 100 or Unity or whatever your scale is. That's what I did, 100. It, yeah, they've proved, proves the wrong word, but it's pretty much shown that it's kind of, Either zero or unity. Zero is ever so slightly better dynamic range, but almost not worth it. Yeah. The only reason uh, I the only reason I've used higher yeah. than that is when I want to capture objects that are moving. So I'll run two forty or three hundred to catch a asteroid or a, a, a comet with short exposures, because otherwise they they smear on the on the. On, on, the on other cameras that can work, but for this one, you you're really not gaining any any brightness the loss of i i think they say that the the dynamic gain doesn't get any better even if you you know bump up the amp a little bit there you have to read into oh. the nitty gritty and cloudy nights but well yeah. the, Maybe. The, the i the idea here is you get it, you get deeper faster with shorter exposures yeah so i can go 15 seconds and still grab that 15th magnitude asteroid yeah. as opposed to gating of 100 I won't, I won't necessarily get deep enough in 15 seconds i'd have to go longer exposures if i go longer exposures then then i start getting trailing if it's moving a lot that's the only reason i use the higher gains in the asi air app that i use to control it on their little raspberry pi thing uh you can't even set that camera higher than 100 unity well sg pro let SG Pro will let you sure, force sure. it. Yes. I'm just saying that they they don't think it's worthwhile, so they just... No, I, I know. That's it. I know. If you, oh, if you pull up... Even the bucket if, you, and all, so. if you pull up the settings the for the ZWS, they won't let you go any harder on the settings. But if you yeah. if you set it from an external source, it sends it down to that camera, it will set it. Yep, yep. So that's... A, that's a, so I, I'm going to probably stick with 190 on my two cameras. Now, I've actually got three three of these CWOs now, two a pair of 071s and then this 2600. Do you have any planetary cameras, smaller ones, non-cooled? No. Okay. I use those for guiding. I use one of the old 71s for guiding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got that big on-axis on, on axis thing, yeah. 
but actually I could use this 2600 for planetary. It's got the 3.7 micron or 3.8 micron pixels. And I could run it uh, 4,000 millimeter on my 10 inch with a Barlow. Sure. I could do planetary, to planetary with that if I really want. Because all I would do is shrink it down and use a region of interest. So it would be fast anyway. Yeah. It, most people don't consider that for planetary because it's too expensive, but certainly can be used. Oh, yeah. It's a, I yeah. like to use it if I'm trying to capture, like, for instance, Saturn with moons. So because it, it's larger than most planetary, yep. Yep. It, larger field of view, you can capture, you know, half a dozen moons in there in the same field of view. So Right, right. But I've done that with Venus. I actually used my old 71 and dropped it down about 640 by 480. And took one of my, my only time that I've ever taken a Venus through a telescope shot in my entire career astronomy career yeah. and i thought it, it came out kind of neat i was i was surprised actually without andy barlow that's just prime focus on the 10 inch so well it's fun stuff you know i'm just experimenting trying things out so anyways uh, the point is, is uh, the one night i've had with the 2600 was five days ago and uh this came out with pretty nice i thought after mm -hmm. only, uh, th for only three hours and then this was uh, with the four, the uh, 300 millimeter lens with the 071. I didn't push the color at all in this one. I just let it be what it was going to be. And then um, this would have been uh, June 16th. I did a, a, an area of uh, M52, the bubble, a couple of other NGCs, and actually the, there's that Nova's in here somewhere. I think it's right here or right here. But anyways, this was this was. Uh, uh, 38 minutes of data, and I was surprised how deep I got with that uh, 300 millimeter f4. Do you have any ability to put in uh, filters? No. With that astro. Well, well but actually, I've got I've got a UVI or cut filter with a 10 inch, so yeah, I can screw them in. Up on the front, maybe. No, right there in front of the camera. The M40. If it's an M42 thread, I can put it on the on any of these cameras. But it's not a slide in. I don't have any other filter yeah, yeah, yeah. wheels or anything like that. Because um, those narrow band, like dual band, would get rid of a lot of those stars if that's what you want. Get so your and then your lagoon would pop, and a lot of that uh, background stars would be diminished. No, I, if that's I what you're looking the, for. Yeah, no, I, I I know a lot of guys do that. They love to have the nebula only if they could get yeah. away with it. I, I, but, I, I, I like it, but yeah. yeah. I, I kind of like the the fact that it's it's filled with yeah. with information. Got dark lanes, got all this background radiation plus these high, higher uh, emission nebulas. It's kind of new in the reflection there. I was going to try was... to I was trying to try to shoot those targets, but the narrow window between trees that I got on my pro I just I'm I'm too surrounded by trees. It's this came out maybe an hour and a half on that, and I just didn't want to wait, so I started on the iris. So this, this again, this is another test shot with that 300 millimeter. Now, I do have some tilt in the system. I looked yeah. at the I looked at these corners, so I'm going to do some work on it. But this still came out pretty nice for a first shot. All right, beautiful. So, thank you very much, everybody. I see y'all got up to some fun during the break, but let's filter on back so that we can reconvene and get on with our feature presentation of the night. Uh, so I do have a question that occurred during the break, which is the discussion of smoke. Um, just to clarify, since uh, for those of you who are not uh, up to what's uh, been going on in a very chaotic world, there's been some major wildfires out west, including in Canada, uh, very, very bad fires in British Columbia. So, uh, yeah, that stuff comes our way. All right, um, and with that, I would like to pass things over to Dr. Tail Parton to introduce the long form presentation. Okay, thank you, Diane. Doug Bach uh, will bring us our main presentation tonight. Um, he's previously served as president, vice president, and editor for the Warren Astronomical Society. 
And I might add, he was our main speaker just a month ago. So he's really been contributing a lot. Uh, it's just lit watching what he was doing just now. And we, Doug, we really appreciate your contributions. Thank You've you. been a member of this club for almost 50 years. Uh, he was chairman and vice chairman of the Great Lakes region of the Astronomical League back in the early 80s. Uh, and he has the Northern Cross Observatory. He was just showing us pictures he took there. Um, tonight, Doug will speak on 10 questions you have asked or will ask during your astronomy hobby. Doug, uh, we're looking forward to it. Take it away. Thank you, Dale. Appreciate the intro. Um, so tonight's talk is uh, I was asked to um, update this talk. Uh, Dale asked me to update this talk from a talk that I gave to the Northern Michigan uh, Am Astronomy Club back about four or five years ago. So I have updated it. I don't think anybody in this club has actually seen it because I only I think I only gave it at the at the Northern Michigan Club meeting. But in any case, 10 questions that you have asked or will ask in this presentation, I'll discuss some basic ideas and questions that most beginners have asked relative to this hobby. So if you are new to the hobby, this might be useful to you. However, I do touch on some more advanced ideas throughout the presentation. So the more advanced members should get something out of this as well. If nothing else, uh, at least a chuckle. Uh, I would add that it can be argued that there are actually more than 10 questions here. Uh, but some of the ideas I collected together for uh, clarity. Okay, there's actually more than 10. There were 12. <laughs> so this is the agenda. You know, what what telescope should I get? What are the different telescope designs? The different mount designs? The eyepieces should I get? How do I calculate magnification? What are the different eyepiece designs? What is collimation? What does culmination, zenith, meridian, and circumpolar mean? How do I find objects in the sky? What is integrated magnitude? What is averted vision and weather? What is seeing and transparency? And what do we look for in, the, in weather when we go out? So uh, like I said, there's actually more than, more than 10. <clears throat> so the first question is what telescope should I get? And we get this question a lot in the astronomy forums online. Um, I, I belong to uh, home observatories, do-it-yourself projects, various astronomy forums online that um, I read through and sometimes participate in. And so this question, though, is a loaded question because it really depends on a lot of things. Like, what do you want to do with it, visual or astrophotography? What is your budget? Will you travel with it? Will it fit in your vehicle? Can you lift the components to move it? How easy is it to use? So what I did was I put together this very high level uh, thought starter. And that is, if you want to do visual down this left tree, uh, then and you want to do visual, is it going to be just planetary and or DS, uh, deep sky objects? If it's deep sky objects, you might want to consider getting a Newtonian reflector on a down mount. And, and one that's uh, a good size that you can afford, which is probably going to be one of your cheaper solutions, and that you can actually carry it or put it in your vehicle and haul it around. So that's one, one possibility. If it's for planetary, you might consider getting a Max Sutoff or a, a schmidt cassegrain telescope or a long focal length a refractor uh, in, on a nice mount, either alt azimuth or equatorial. And so the reason you would go out to get the long focal length is you get more magnification on these small objects called planets, as opposed to deep sky objects. <clears throat> but if you want to go down the imaging train, again, are you going to do planetary or, or deep sky objects? If you're only going to do planetary, you can get by with, uh, again, one of these long focal length systems, but you'd want it probably on a, a nice mount, uh, either alt azimuth or equatorial mount that has tracking on it. In other words, a drive system on it. That way it'll stay, keep the object in the field of view while you're running your videos. And in planetary imaging, you actually run videos and use some software to take the best frames of that video. And when I say that the best frames of that video, the reason you take a video 
is you want to be able to catch those moments of good seeing, which I'll be talking about later in the presentation. Uh, those moments of good seeing when you take uh, high frame rate videos allows you to pull out the best ones, let's say out of the thousands you just took. And that's that's one reason you want to have a good a reasonable tracking system to do that. If you want to do deep sky objects, you want to get a, a solid equatorial mount that allows you to do auto guiding and also will track the Earth's rotation. So you can do longer exposures like a minute, two minutes, five minutes, whatever. But that's going to be uh, the more most expensive uh, option of the of the four that I'm showing you here. Now, there are different kinds of designs, and here's the next question is, what are some of the different telescope optical designs? <clears throat> well, Newtonians can be the cheapest way to get large aperture for viewing, and cat and uh, catadioptrics are, are uh, compact, so they're probably easier to haul around for the same aperture. If you're going to get an 8-inch Newtonian versus an 8-inch schmidt cassegrain an 8-inch schmidt cassegrain may be easier to haul around because it's a little shorter tube. You can fit it into spaces that you might not fit uh, an F6. Newtonian, in, for example. But the design of a Newtonian is basically on the right here is the um, parabolic mirror where the light comes in from this side on the right from the star, bounces off this parabolic mirror, comes out to this uh, secondary uh, flat mirror, which is angled at 45 degrees to bring it out to a location here where your eyepiece or your imaging camera is sitting. So that's the basics behind a Newtonian reflector. The design behind a catheter optic is a three element system where you have a corrector plate, a uh, spherical primary, uh, which is concave, uh, and then you have a convex secondary mirror, which brings it back down through uh, the uh, central part of the telescope to your eyepiece and or camera. And then the third kind is uh, that we, we are talking about tonight is the refractor. And that's a simple lens system that uh, directs the Focus to a eyepiece or camera directly down the tube. There are a couple types that you can look at, and one of them is the um, achromatic, which is typically a two-element lens like you see here, but it has uh, issues with color correction that are not wonderful, but uh, can still be used visually very, very nicely. And then there's the apochromatic, which is either a, a three-element or more elements for color correction, or with some special exotic glass that'll do color correction for you. So those are the kind of the three types that, that people will be looking at. And here's examples in the field of each of those types. This is a refractor. I think this is my friend Brian Shoemaker who's brought his system down to the boon one, one night uh, uh, or a couple of days uh, uh, several years ago. He's got a set of refractors there on this mount. And then here's a Schmidt Cassegrain. It's a, um, I think, 11-inch HD uh, Schmidt Cast from Celestron. And then here's a Newtonian on a Daub style mount. This is John Lines's mount. Uh, I, this was either his 18 or now it's 15. He's got uh, a reflector. So those are the three kinds that we just talked about. What are the different mount designs? Well, generally what we have on the market are equatorial mounts and alt azimuth mounts. The main difference between the two is the Eucatron mount has one axis pointing at the north celestial uh, pole, like this one does here, with the RA and deck as your coordinates. So the RA is around this circle, and the deck is around this, this angle here. So this is RA right ascension, and this is declination. The alt azimuth mounts are, have one axis pointing at the local zenith, okay, and with altitude and azimuth as your coordinates. So Azimuth goes around from the cardinal point north. North cardinal point starts at zero degrees and goes around towards the east and then to the south and to the west and then back to the north from zero to 360. And then your altitude goes from zero at a horizon to 90 degrees overhead. Now, those equatorial mounts can be German equatorial mounts or fork mounts or sometimes English yoke mounts or whatever, but they are all basically pointing at the north celestial pole. That's why they're called equatorial mounts. Alt azimuth mounts are typically daubs or can be on forks. Uh, anyway, basically up, down, left, and right. Here's an example of an equatorial mount. This uh, happens to be in my backyard, um, a Los Monte G11 mount. It's, this is polar aligned with the north celestial pole there. Polar aligned with the north celestial pole here. And then, um, so I only need to track on the RA side. <clears throat> 
And I use this to do astrophotography. Here's an example of an alt azimuth mount. Uh, this, this is an uh, alt azimuth mount with, with a Dobsonian designed rocker box or, or platform, which uh, was named after John, Do John Dobson. This is a, a configuration that allows you to um, put most of your money in the optics. There's a 20 inch mirror at the bottom, and this was just the biggest cost of this, this telescope. And, but you can put dig digital setting circles on it. It allows you to use it. It's a microprocessor computer. It allows you to use it to uh, find objects by doing a two-star alignment at the beginning of the night and use encoders on the uh, altitude here. And there's one in the base uh, for azimuth. And it will help you push. You have to push this. There's no motor on this. You have to push it to the, to the object by following the digital outputs of that, uh, of those setting, uh, digital setting circles. So. And this is an example of an alt azimuth mount with a little bit of computer uh, operations associated with it. Or you can star hop. The next question is what eyepieces should I use or should I get? <clears throat> well, I like, to, I like about a one degree field of view for my low power eyepiece between 50 and 70 power. And the, mo the most used eyepiece that I have is a, it happens to be a 13 millimeter uh, eyepiece, and sometimes the 17 millimeter. Uh, and those are what I would call the mid, mid range or medium power eyepieces, pretty much in that, in that range. Excuse me. But when seeing is excellent, the eight and the five give great views, but that is rare. So here's my eight and five millimeter eyepieces. The eight gets to use a little bit, little bit more, but the five is very rare to get seen good enough to throw that on there. Excuse me. Um, so it really depends on the scene you have. So you have low, medium, and high power eyepieces. You can get away with three for almost everything that you need to, you want to do. A fourth and a fifth are nice. Maybe a fourth one would be a very, very low power eyepiece, like a 30, mil, a 30 millimeter eyepiece that gives you a wider field of view, et cetera. So those those are options that you might want. This happens to be the five uh, one of the my sets of of eyepieces that are matched. This is a, a lanthanum LVW um, uh, observing set. It's a 65 degree apparent field of view, and I'll go over that in a little bit here. But I also have a, a set of Naglers. I've got a 4.8, a 7, and a 13 millimeter Nagler plus a 27 panoptic. So I have two sets of uh, eyepieces because I have multiple telescopes. And if I'm doing uh, uh, observing nights with multiple people want to use the scopes, then I have more than one set of eyepieces to use. But with eyepieces, you'll want a case. This is an old case that I had. I've actually got uh, all my eyepieces in some um, Apache uh, uh, cases now that are uh, basically uh, uh, Pelican lookalikes, and so they're a little more sturdy. But those are the these are the um, these are the uh, lanthanums I have. There's one in here, one in here, and then some of my Naglers. And I have other things in here. Is my laser uh, collimator, etc. So you want to have a case to hold all of those things. So part of the 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 um, getting eyepieces is determining what magnification you have. Uh, with a given telescope, you have certain eyepieces, and you have certain certain uh, telescopes and/or a, a telescope. And then here's an example where you calculate that by taking the telescope focal length and dividing by the eyepiece focal length. It's pretty simple. If you have a thousand millimeter thousand millimeter focal length, which is something like a 10 inch f4 or 4 inch f10, uh, and you put a 20 millimeter eyepiece in there, it'll be 50 power. So it's a thousand millimeter divided by 20. If you put a 10 millimeter in there, you'll be twice the power, 100 power. If you happen to have a Bartle, that doubles up the, the magnification of a given set of telescopes slash eyepieces, as, as, as an example there. Here's an example magnification chart. This is for the 14 inch that I've got, but it's, it's kind of convenient to have a little chart for your telescope and your eyepieces that you, you might have. Uh, available to to keep track of uh, what power you're running, et cetera, especially when you're doing public open houses or public events where they ask you, well, what power is this? And you know, I have to look at my chart. Oh yeah, that's right, my 13 millimeters 
126 power on my 14 inch uh, telescope. As you, and I actually put down here approximately the amount of usage I get out of each of these eyepieces. This one's 65% of the time is my 13. 17% of the time is my is the 17. Now that kind of turns around a little bit when I'm using the 18 inch uh, telescope. And that is the 17 gets a little more use than the 13 because it's a longer focal length. So eyepieces again, uh, eyepiece designs. Uh, the quality and design and expense of eyepieces vary. Your choices will depend on how much you want to spend, how much eye relief you want, and I can go into what that is. And that means how far your eye can be from the lens when you're looking through it and still be able to see the field of view. Uh, that's called eye relief. Um, and how wide a field of view uh, did you do you want in your final view that you're looking at? And when I talk about field of view, there's the apparent field of view of an eyepiece, and that's just the eyepiece itself. And then there's the total field of view when it's used with a telescope. <clears throat> so that the combination of the two will determine what your your field of view through the scope looks like. And what I mean by that is a a, lo a lower field of, a apparent field of view of the of a of a eyepiece like a plosal, which is anywhere from 48 to 52 degrees apparent field of view. That will look at, be looking at less of the uh, of the uh, cone of light coming through your main scope, uh, less angle of the cone of light coming through your scope than a wide field uh, uh, eyepiece like these six and eight element uh, eyepieces that are sold. And those could be 65 to 100 degree. Some I think there's now 110 degree out there. Really wide field uh, eyepieces that you can you can get, but the optical designs basically are. I'm going to only go through two of them, and that is the ones that are around the 50 50 degree apparent field are usually plazals. There are four elements like this, and these are fine for anything that's in the f7 to f10 or f20, f15. Plazals are just fine for longer focal length systems because you're not going to have a wide field anyways, or a, a steep cone of uh, light coming into the eyepiece. These eight element eyepieces were designed for these F4s and F5 uh, uh, Newtonians with uh, with short F ratios to, to in order to catch that steep cone of light coming in and flatten it out by the time it gets to your eye. <clears throat> this is an example of a 70 degree, but it's basically a, a, an eight element lens, just like the the um, Naglers and the lanthan. My lanthanums are 65 degrees, but they're also eight elements. So. Those are eyepiece designs. So now the question is, what is collimation? Collimation is a means to align um, the optical and mechanical uh, centers of the telescope. That means the light's going to be, uh, the telescope will come to the same focal plane when viewing uh, an object. In other words, across the entire, entire field of view comes to the same focal plane and not tilted. A Newtonian reflector is a simple two mirror system that tends to require periodic checking and alignment, but it is especially true if you are traveling to locations and have to get uh, set up each time. So it's convenient to have a, a Cheshire collimation toolkit or a laser tool uh, collimation toolkit to do check your alignment. The diagram on the bottom is, is basically um, the worst case scenario where the first thing you got to do is make sure that this is the eyepiece holder, your focuser, basically, that the physical part of the secondary is actually centered in the outer ring here of the um, focuser itself. Then the next thing you want to do is make sure that the secondary mirror is, is pointing at the entire circle of the primary in your field of view. And then the third thing you want to do is center the primary itself on the, on the, you know, by using the secondary reflection. The adjustments in the middle one here and the first and second one here are using the adjustments on the secondary. The last one is using the adjustments on the primary. You do this two, si two times and you'll realize that it's not that difficult to do once you get the hang of how to do it. Are there any questions so far on these first uh, set of questions that I've that I post here. Okay. 
Let's move on then. So what does culmination, meridian, zenith, and circumpolar mean? Well, culmination is that point where an object reaches your local meridian. And this is your local meridian. This blue circle here is the local meridian goes through this your zenith right overhead. From the north cardinal point to, from zenith to the south cardinal point. That's your meridian. <clears throat> zenith is that point directly overhead. Circumpolar objects never set from your local latitude on the planet. For example, from this ladder, the stars in the Big Dipper never set. And that's what this little circle here is. And these are stars that do not set below the horizon. They're called circumpolar objects or circumpolar stars. Big Dipper is an example of that. So it goes from the upper culmination point to the lower culmination point. There's a lower culmination point for everything, but things that are down here are below the horizon. But in the, our area, the objects that are in the far enough north, the lower culmination is still up. Okay, so that's what upper and lower culmination mean. Okay, this could be considered four questions. <laughs> So how to find a, a object in the sky? Well, one way is to get star charts. As Gary Ross went through, he was using star charts to find his object uh, last year. And I used to, uh, a lot of people use star charts when they first started out. And I used star charts for decades, um, starting in the 60, mid 60s. And the star chart basically is a map of the sky where it has coordinate systems like this, where this is the, uh, the uh, declination, or this is the RA line, this is the deck lines. And here's a constellation triangulum which has uh, these three stars plus various uh, galaxies identified, including the M33, there's a galaxy right here. And what you would do is you could use the, these two, uh, three stars to find M33 if you wanted to, but I happen to go off of uh, Pegasus to do that. In any case, that's that's what you would use, uh, star charts. And you would use the star hopping method to get there. This helps you learn the sky, and they can be in paper form, the charts can, or you can get an app on your mobile device if you prefer to do that. Another way to get to a, a, a telescope with go-to capability is a computer on the telescope has thousands of objects stored in its memory. You simply enter the object you want to see, and it either moves itself or guides you to manually move it to the object. Now, with these kinds of scopes with the digital setting circles, whether it's a go-to or not, uh, or a push-to, requires an initial setup of time, date, and uh, two-star alignment usually uh, at the beginning of the night so that the scope knows where it's pointing when it's done with the initial setup. Therefore, it knows where to move the scope when you ask it to move to a, a new location, like M13 or whatever. And there's the, another way to, to um, find things is to let the entire system do it for you. And one of the ways you can do that is what's called plate solving. <clears throat> I use plate solving to uh, image my objects. And what it means is that I don't have to do a two star alignment ever. The mount is polar aligned. As long as it's polar aligned, it's got a good coordinate system frame of reference. What plate solving means is you tell it, you just uh, have your software tell it to go to M13. The scope will slew to M13. It will take a snapshot of the sky it's looking at. It will solve what it's looking at and compare it to a database that it has available to it and say, oh, I'm not, I am actually over here a little bit because that's the stars that I see. And I need to move it this far in RA and this far in DEC. And so we'll move it again, take another snapshot, compare the image to its database and say, okay, I'm on the object now. And now I can start my data integration. So the point being is that your the scope system, the computerized system itself is taking a picture of the sky, making a decision whether it's where it's supposed to be, 
and then and then moving to the object uh, before we'll continue on the work. So you don't have to star hop, you don't have to do an uh, two star alignment or push to, it does everything automatically. This is the reason that, uh, this is an advanced feature and is the reason I use it, it for uh, my automated system for imaging, because it manages the mount and the camera. And I can go to bed when it's taking 10 hours worth of images in the middle of winter. But that's the third way of, 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 uh, of uh, having your scope find where it's looking in the sky. What is integrated magnitude? So integrated magnitude, uh, some of you know what magnitude is. A stellar magnitude is, a, is the magnitude of a star, which is a pinpoint source of light. So there's a magnitude that's in the blue, they, they, they can calculate if it's in the blue part of the spectrum or the white light part of the spectrum, et cetera, et cetera. But in general, stars are a pinpoint source of light. So therefore the magnitude is what it is. In an extended object, the magnitude that they list is an integrated magnitude, which means in an object like this galaxy, the magnitude that it gives for 5.7 is everything that's in the field of view plus actually the total diameter of the object, which is 73 by 45 arc minutes. This is M33, which doesn't fit in my camera uh, on my system, but it takes that 5.7 is the total amount of light coming in off of that object in that total area which is basically over a degree by three quarters of a degree in size. All that data integrated as if it was a single point of data, 5.7, which means that the galaxy itself is really hard to see. It should be naked eye if it's 5.7, right? Well, in a really dark sky, you can kind of see it because it's at one power with your naked eye. But if you were to put a, you would need a scope on it to see anything of this size, excuse me, uh, because it's, it is uh, integrated over that large amount of area. <clears throat> Deep sky objects such as nebula and galaxy have an angular size, which uh, when viewed will seem dimmer than the reported magnitude. And that's because it is an integrated magnitude. What is averted vision? Averted vision is a technique that visual observers will use to detect an object that is right at the edge of your visual acuity with your telescope, your eyepiece, and your eye. If it's brighter, you can see it probably on X, as you can see it normally with your eye, just looking right through the eyepiece. But Averted vision is a technique to detect an object which is right at the threshold of, uh, of your seeing. And, the, and what that means is you don't look directly at the object. You look, because uh, when you're looking at directly at the objects, you're primarily using the cones in your eye. If you look slightly off axis, slightly away from you using the rods in your eye. And those are a little more sensitive than the cones. And they will pick up the, the extended objects better. The other technique to help with that, in fact, is to use a, what I use for contrast detection is to tap the scope just slightly, just a little slightly tap it. And what you'll see is the modeling of, a, say, a galaxy cluster like Stefan's Quintet will suddenly kind of pop in, into your averted vision because the contrast between the modeling of those galaxies and the background sky is black. You will see that, that slight difference you just tap the scope because your eye is going to pick up that motion and therefore it's going to pick up that contrast. That's another technique to use for, uh, for picking up dim objects. And I use, I use these techniques um, like inverted division and um, this contract detection method of tapping the scope to determine the transparency of the sky that night. For example, in the fall, I look at uh, Stefan's Quintet is one of my favorites to go after because the brightest galaxy there is 12.8. The rest of them are 13th magnitude or slightly dimmer. And that tells me with the given scope that I have in the sky condition I have, whether it's going to be a good transparency night. If I can see all five of them with the 14 inch, I know it's going to be a decent night for, for visual. Uh, 
<clears throat> so weather, what is seeing and transparency? Well, seeing represents how good or steady the sky is and transparency represents how clear the sky is. <clears throat> in general, the calendar, the, the, the calmer, the, I'm sorry, in general, the calmer the lo lower and, and upper atmosphere are, the better the seeing is going to be. It may appear clear out, but if there's a lot of turbulence in the air, the scene will be poor. Typically, if the jet stream's running over, right over you, really, you know, a couple hundred miles an hour, you're going to, or you have lower level winds that are, uh, you know, of significant velocity, you're not going to have very good seeing. So the stars are going to going to bubble up a little bit, or if you're looking at a planet with some magnification, it's going to bubble a lot. So that's poor seeing. What you want is 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 good seeing. <clears throat> where the, the uh, sky turbulence is very low. Transparency, however, is uh, how clear the sky is. If it's hazy, the transparency is poor, but often the seeing will be good during these times because there isn't much turbulence when you have high haze. It's not blowing away uh, the clouds. And so your seeing might actually be good even if your transparency is poor, which is good for looking at planets or the moon. This clear sky chart that you see here is an example of how they predict the various components of the sky conditions on any given night. <clears throat> and uh, this example would be cloud cover is the first one, blue is good, transparency is light blue, which means about average, and seeing is a little light, light, light blue, is, which would either be average or slightly below average. And then they have smoke conditions, wind, humidity, and temperatures. This is only one of the tools that I look at and uh, tells me uh, what it might be like. <clears throat> another another tool I use, astrospheric. This is a tool that has similar ideas here. This is a cloud layer. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, transparency, and this is seeing conditions. And in this particular night, it's be poor seeing conditions according to this. This also goes out uh, 10 days. There's another part of the chart that I didn't show you here. Gives you temperatures. Um, position of the sun and the moon relative to rise and set times, et cetera, for the month. And that gives you an idea of cloud cover where you're at. So that's that's the second part of seeing and transparency is checking these kinds of things. The third way of checking testing uh, or testing your seeing on transparency is to do, be, do it right at the eyepiece. An example would be, uh, I like to go after um, globular clusters to see what the seeing's like. If I can put that eight millimeter eyepiece in there in the 17 inch and the stars at the center of that ga that cluster are pinpoint, then I know it's good seeing. If I can put the five in there, I know it's excellent seeing. <clears throat> but in transparency, you can also do that at, at, the, at the eyepiece. Again, I described looking at the Stephens Quintet as an example of how they determine whether the sky transparency is good or not. <clears throat> but you can use other galaxies as well. So, or, or extended objects are a good way to determine transparency or night. And again, that does that does mean that you have to have a little bit of experience over time of what various nights look like with the same objects. And that's why I always try to use the same objects night to night for determining seeing and transparency. Excuse me a second here. Now, there's one more question you need to ask. Honey, can I buy some new equipment? This one, you are on your own. <laughs> However, if you're lucky like me, I can buy anything I want as long as we, uh, we can afford it. And here's just two of my current telescopes. This is my 10 inch uh, imaging system with, a, with that, that 300 millimeter lens on top. And then this is one of my dobs that I use, the 14 inch uh, dob that I have. So those are my two mainstays right now. And actually in the corner here is a, a Celestron SE mount with a six inch SCT sitting in that case right there. So that's a, my, one of my portable units for solar viewing. <clears throat> so most important though, is to have fun. It's the most important thing in this hobby is to try to have some fun. <clears throat> So any Q&A, that's the end of my presentation. Excellent presentation, Doug. I hope we have some uh, good questions. 
Come on, y'all. Decloak and fire that those questions. You should have something uh something percolating in the head after the way Doug laid that out. By the way, there's a lot more questions that could be asked, but um <laughs> I only had 45 minutes, so <laughs> no, that was perfect. That was a. Uh... So Doug, I have a question. Um yeah about eyepieces. So there's a lot of different optical designs and so forth. Um, if you buy a set of eyepieces, might they only be good in certain type of telescopes, um, but maybe not good in another set? For instance, good for an SCT at relatively slow speeds, but if you put it in a fast daub, they might be poor or just maybe not perfect? So, so. The, there, there is an answer to that question, and that, that is, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'm going to reverse it. If you get yourself a 100-degree field of view eyepiece, you know, a $300 or $600 eyepiece, and you put it into an F11 SCT, and I will tell you you're wasting your money. However, it does have some advantages in an F4 Dobsonian because the cone of light coming to you is sharper than it is in an SCT. So you're picking up a wider field automatically because it's at F4 instead of F11. If you, only had, if you only had a long focal length refractor or SCT, you can get away with uh, nice plausels or Brandon's for that matter. Okay. Your 100 millimeter eyepiece is not getting you much. Because your focal length is so long that your cone of light is, is very narrow to start with. But if you have both an SET and an 18 inch top, which I have, I'm going to get the 65 or this, I'm going to get the eight element eyepieces for either one. And that is, it's, it's, a, it's a, a middle of the road one that I have, 65 millimeter. And I can't see wider than 65 millimeter apparent field of view and with my glasses on anyways. So the 100 millimeter one, I've, I've tried the 100 millimeter one in my 18. You know what I got to do? I got to take my glasses off. I have to get that eye in there and I have to look around like a, it's like, it's like a, a portal in a ship to see everything. I can't see it all at once with one, with a single view. I have to actually look around. And I, I, I some people like that. But if I'm going to wear my glasses, I couldn't. I couldn't even get close enough to see that entire hundred degree field of view. Okay. So I guess the point is, is depending on what what you want to do. If you want to have that big portal in the sky and you got an F4 system, you might want to get the five hundred, six hundred dollar eyepiece. I don't know. They're maybe running twelve hundred now, for all I know. <laughs> Some probably are. Yeah, but these two hundred and sixty dollar eight element. Vixens that I got, I've had for 20 years now, work just fine for me. I've also got some Naglers, but they're not, they're like 60 or 82 degree Naglers. They're not 100, 115 degree ones. And they work fine as well. Explain the difference of a Nagler from a standard uh, uh, lot lens. What do you um, actually, with a Nagler? A name. But I'm saying, what does it actually do that would be different? If you if you compare the actual optical systems, like for like, okay, like for like, in other words, they're exactly the same optical system. There's no difference on the name tag. Okay. Okay, if they're the same optical system. Okay. And assuming that the same optical quality. Okay. However, Nagler likes to make all the, uh, makes a lot of different kinds. So does Explorer Scientific has a, a portfolio. It's a lot of different kinds, all the way to 110 or degree angle ones. And then most of those are, are six or eight element uh, lens uh, eyepieces, just like the, the Naglers are. So again, you're in some cases, you're buying a name brand. Uh, Naglers are, are a top of the line, I agree. Are they 2% better at 50% at higher cost or 100% higher cost? Yeah, maybe, but are you willing to spend that kind of money? I grew up on orthoscopics when I was in- That's what I was gonna ask. I was in, in orthoscopics and conics when I was in, in uh, high school, right? And those exit pupils out of 10 millimeter are like a quarter of an inch. I could not use my glasses. I always, always had to take my eyes, uh, eyeglasses off to look through those little portholes that were 
there. And those are 50 degree, um, approximately 50 degree of field of, uh, apparent field of view uh, eyepieces. Uh, they were fine for my t 8 inch F7. They're not as nice as the eight element lenses I got now. I fully agree with that. But they didn't cost $300. They only cost $25 when I bought them. So it's a trade off. And is it is it also true that I've heard that the the lower the number, the millimeter, uh, the larger scope you really need to do it right, or the quality you lose a lot of quality when you go down to this four millimeter, no, five no, millimeter, it, six millimeter. No, the quality disappears because you're seeing. Okay. Assuming you have a, a, a an optical system that's um, you know really good, like a Strel rating of 0.98. If you have an optical system that's excellent uh, as your primary scope, um, your four millimeter, your three millimeter will work just fine if you have absolutely steady seeing. In other words, ex excellent seeing. They will work. You can you can leverage that. But how often does that happen, especially in this state? <laughs> okay, that's why I say most of the time, thirteen millimeters is about as far as I go. Sometimes the eight millimeter because the seeing might be good enough for it. But okay. I use my 13 more than anything. Okay. Thank you. All cool. right, more questions. I think Teresa had a comment in the chat. Oh, we have several in the chat. Good. Um, da, 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 da. Teresa says she took some print screens. Kelly says, good intro to the hobby, hobby Doug. And Michael Young on YouTube says, where is the Northern Cross Observatory and what Bortle skies do you have there? So the Northern Cross Observatory is 150 feet from me right here in my backyard. And I'm south of Fenton, Michigan, about 10 miles. Do I have any other pics of the observatory? Yes. Well, funny like you this. should ask. Funny you should ask. Let me see here. I'm going to pull up my folder called My Telescopes. There we go, My Telescopes. <clears throat> Let's see here. Here's the observatory in my backyard. OK, it's a roll off roof observatory. And let's see here. I used to have, uh, on the same exact platform right there, I used to have this observatory with this scope in it. This is back in 1980, in the mid-80s. It's my 12 and a half inch. I still have that, the whole system that's stored away. So I've had that. Um, and that looked like this in exactly the same location as the current one. Um, these are some of the scopes I've had over the years. Uh, this is what I've got up at Boone. Well, not all of these, but four, four of the five are up at Boone. So this is my other observatory, what I call Boone Hill Observatory. It's got a, the 25 inch, the 18 inch, this 10 inch dom, this five inches portal. This is a friend had that up there for a few months so when I took the picture. It's not that, that one, that obsession's not there right now. <clears throat> This is what happens when I go mobile. So I take it up to Boone. I may not ever do that again. <laughs> it's quite complicated to take the system up anywhere. <clears throat> Any other questions associated with that? 
No, but we got a good one about eye relief in eyepieces from Catherine, who wears glasses like me. Her understanding is that eye relief means more money. It's actually a little more complicated than that. So, so what, one of the things that an eight element, um, let me back up to this eight element thing here. Eye pieces. Can I go? Yeah, here we go. One of the things that this design gives you is a flat field on a, when you have a sharp cone of light coming in off an F4 system, this flattens it out for you. So by the time it gets here, it's, it's a, a nice flat field all the way from edge to edge. The second thing is <clears throat> they can design it so it gives you a, a, a long eye relief. In my case, the eye pieces that I'm talking about um, here, here, these guys, Every one of these has got 20 millimeter eye relief. Not quite a full inch behind the complete last piece of glass, but quite a quite quite nice, a 20 millimeter eye piece or a 20 millimeter eye relief. That's the reason I got this set. And and by the way, this set it's all par focal. And, uh, and and another, by the way, they don't sell this set anymore. But you can get eye pieces with with uh, good eye relief. And I wear glasses. I am blind without my glasses, so I I have to wear my glasses to get around at night. The only time I ever take them off is to look through an eyepiece uh, when I'm observing by myself. But the eyepieces that I have are 20 millimeter eye relief, and they're plenty, plenty good for um, for uh, uh, wearing glasses. And the field of view on the apparent field of view on, on my lanthanums are only 65 degrees, so I don't lose any of that field of view at all with my glasses. Um, yeah, it would mean more money if the eye relief on the, on the, uh, plazos aren't long enough for you. You might have to go to this six or eight element lenses to, to get that eye relief you want. Yeah, really for me, I wear glasses too. And it really depends kind of like on the make, like we have some eye pieces that are technically very good, but I just don't find them comfortable for me. Well, the yeah, I mean, even some of my Naglers aren't all that comfortable. These lanthanums are actually more comfortable with glasses on than my Naglers are. That's cool. Have to check yeah. that out. Yeah. Um, so Explore Scientific and Orion, and um, they both make make sixty five degree eyepieces with eight elements as well. And actually, hype is it Hyperion? Uh, one of them. And what I found was that the reviews on those four brands, the top two were the Vixens and the um, Explore Scientific for these eight element 65 degree eyepieces. Whereas the Orions and the, uh, the one that starts with an H, I can't remember the name of it right offhand, were not quite, did not have quite the same flat field of view out to the edge. In other words, they were 70% flat and then the outer 30% was not. So you got to be got to be a little careful about the brands that you get, um, whether they they guarantee flat field to the edge or not. In other words, <clears throat> if you want flat field, get yourself a fifty degree plazel, it should be just fine. But don't get anything longer than a twenty five millimeter uh, plazel because once you start getting the thirty twos and forty millimeters, your field's not going to be flat anyways because they they'll have to go to a two inch a barrel, and they can't they can't. They cannot flatten a, a, a uh, uh, two inch lens out in four elements. That's 50 degrees. But the center's okay. You get what you pay for in a lot of cases, but sometimes you can overpay and not get that much more. So, any questions on these 12? Yes, 12 questions. Well, I don't have any questions, but I was lucky enough to get a beautiful sunset. Picture Very good. Worth All right. Hey. Well, that was a great talk, Doug, and I think a great set of lessons for even experienced observers to take away. 
especially the point about having fun. So if we don't have any more questions, we can adjourn the meeting and we'll see y'all next Thursday, the 15th, all of 10 days away. Really? Yep. 10 days away. Yeah, one of those months. No, oh, that's okay. That's the way it works out. So happy four, happy fourth. Uh, I've got my camera pointed toward the way the sky looks now. Unfortunately, I was too busy sh shutter bugging away to share it. And Doug, uh, your presentation was excellent, so I wasn't about to compete with that. But it was a uh, beautiful night. Where are you? I am in St. Joseph, Michigan which is um, near the lower western part of the state. Dark here. Yeah, it was clear enough the sun went down below the horizon of the water, directly over the water. So I have a few shots. Oh, Kelly, you, you mentioned, I think you mentioned it. Yeah, you mentioned you you thought I couldn't resist buying that lens. Well, yep, I bought the lens, and I've got a a, a computer-controlled uh, coupler coming from Europe soon, so I can run it automated too. So I'll have two automated optical systems on the on the Los Monte mount uh, running uh, every night from now on. And in in front of everybody who's still here, I would like to thank you, Doug, for trying that out and going ahead and getting it. It's in great hands. It's going to be doing a lot better stuff than it was doing with me. Well, the only reason that's going to happen is like if I, as long as I can get it automated, I'll use it. <laughs> <laughs> I, think you'll, I think you'll get there. Um, I know we were talking about the, uh, and the lens lining up and you being able to use it without much trouble. Yeah, the, the yeah the analysis I went through, uh, I had forgotten the fact that this was not a fixed lens telescope. I.e., <clears throat> it is a it, it's a camera lens which has moving parts in it, so therefore the optical path is going to vary a little bit as you move focus in and out, and you turn stabilizer on and off and things like that. But you can get the same thing with a telescope with your focuser being, you know, a little bit sloppy, like an SCT. Your primary is going to slop a little bit when you're focusing in a refractor you're, or any any scope that's got a focus around it it can move side to side and give you a little bit of tilt so i'm i'm okay with the the amount that i saw there it wasn't terrible good i know you were saying that the pictures were a little sharper i hope you guys aren't hearing a lot of wind um the pictures were a little sharper with that lens than the one that you had so oh yeah my zoom my my canon uh uh, 70 to 300 millimeter Canon lens, uh, kit lens has uh, got color, bad color aberration, can't get round stars off of it. You know, it's it's a cheap lens. This was a, a more professional lens. That's why I wanted to look at it and see if it was, uh, if it would do the job that I want. And it'll be good for my comet hunting. And at the next uh, open house, if I'm doing those still, I'll have two pictures coming up at the same time now instead of just one. <laughs> a, a wide field and a and a and a uh, magnification field. So and actually at F four it's pretty fast. I can pick up a lot of data in a short period of time. That that uh, nebula that uh, uh, yep. Triffid and Lagoon Nebula was uh, those were 60 second shots, I think. Maybe those were the two minute ones. But in any case, that I was surprised how much background uh, nebulosity I got in, in the entire frame uh, of the Milky Way there with the with the dark yeah. things and everything. So that when I saw that, yeah. I said, "Yeah, th this will work." <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, Kurt Hilling was the owner of that lens. He used it for terrestrial use. I bought it from him because he'd replaced it with something, and I then got my larger lens fixed and it wasn't seeing much air time and i said you know what i'll bring it to doug see if you can use it so i'm glad you're putting a fine piece of glass to use so you've yeah, got I just, I just wish you, I, I just wish you gave it to me for nothing that <laughs> i thought about that but 
I have this 14 to 24 Sigma art lens on one of my cameras right now. And I, it was kind of a impulse purchase. So I, well, I helped, I helped you cover part of the cost. You did. I, I appreciate that. And more importantly, if you're getting some good shots with a faster lens, it will be worth it down the line just for pure enjoyment. Yep. Okay. That's all I got. All right. Well, thank you again, Doug. And, uh, we will see you all next Thursday here on the WebEx. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you, Diane. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Happy Fourth. Happy Fourth. All right.